doing good works, holy matrimony, there's communion, penance, penance. I should know this, I want to be Catholic school. Confirmation. 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 It's, I don't know if you have page 33, but it's in verse, uh, uh, point number four. Um, baptism, confirmation, communion, or they call it Holy Eucharist, penance, extreme unction, holy orders, and holy matrimony. So they put all those as a requirement. So when we look at the right statement as a whole, yes, it looks good, but when we begin studying out because of the difference in their definitions, then it begins getting a little bit more. And then we see why they're always hung up on is by works, by works, by works. I know, uh, like I said before, if you, for me, when I try to talk to Catholics and think about Christ, they're fine with salvation, but it's always it has to be by works. It's thrown in there somewhere. We looked at several doctrines so far. We looked at the doctrine of uh, da -da 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 -da. we looked at the doctrine of grace. We looked at the doctrine of water baptism, which can water baptism save you in any way? No, no it's just an outward sign. We do it out of obedience. We also talked through in there that they believe that uh, about infant baptism. We know that infant baptism isn't biblical because infants don't aren't to the point where they can make a decision for Christ yet. Because water baptism, all it is is an outward sign that I'm putting off my old life and I'm taking up a new life in Jesus Christ. Do you know the reason why they baptize an infant? I do not. The reason why they baptize an infant is because when an infant is born, his soul is pure and empty. Keep it pure and empty. You baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to keep the enemy away <coughs> until the child is able to make their own decision on Jesus. Okay. That's interesting. I, what? I got the. That's the whole uh, reasoning behind it. That's the reasoning it. behind it. Yes. That's interesting. Then we move on to we moved on to the doctrine of the Bible. What's that? Which is definitely different. It may be the same words, but it's not interpreted the same way. It's not interpreted the same way. In all honesty and all fairness, if we look at different versions of the Bible, there are no there are different interpretations. However, that's why we stick adherently to the King James because of the way that it was interpreted. We know that there were several different groups set up to determine, uh, translate the King James Bible. Some went off on their own, then they convened and it went higher up. So you had several different committees to decide the King James Version. Also, you look at the line of the transcripts and why it came through. Um, when it comes to the translation of the King James, we know it came through the Textus Receptus or the Received Text. And of course, the problem you get into every other trans other translation as well, including the New King James, is you can't base a translation off of a translation because every time you translate something, you lose meaning. Take it back to the original. Exactly, and that's exactly what the translators of the King James did. Now, we did look at several different um, versions of the Bible that the Catholics might use. We looked at their um, thoughts on it, taken from several different Catholic books. The Knights of Columbus stated that the Bible is not our sole guide. Uh, the Bible is a Catholic book. The New Testament writings were never meant to be the sole and final authority for Christ's revealed truth. We got on to the Bible as what the actual scriptures state concerning the inspiration of the Bible. We got into the doctrine of interpreting the Bible where we know that the Bible is meant to be interpreted in one way because all scripture is given for doctrine and for reproof. And the Bible gives, God gave clear warning in his scriptures not to add or take away from the book. That brought us on to the Apocrypha on the bottom of 36. We know that there were 14 books that are added to some Bibles. They are known as the Apocrypha. Sometimes it occurs in the middle. Sometimes that occurs at the beginning. Sometimes it occurs at the end. We know that they were called the Apocrypha not because they had to deal with the Apocalypse, but because the word Apocrypha literally meant, meant false writings. When we got into the basis of the books, did the Jews of that day accept the Apocrypha as the Word of God? 
In the time frame in which the books of the Apocrypha were written, did the Jews back then hold to them as a sacred text? Yes. No. Nope. Nope. The devout Jews actually pushed them aside. That's where they came up with the term Apocrypha because of false, oh, what did I say? Anyway? False writing. Because even the devout Jews didn't believe them. Because so the Catholics they did. I mean, even if you get into the 1911 version of the King James, I think it has it in there too. But they are nowhere held anywhere as. Let me put it this way: when it comes to the devout Jews, when they were written, which was of course in between Malachi and the Gospels, in between the Old and New Testament, that gap there, even those Jews didn't hold to them as the Word of God. They rejected them because they were full of errors. They were false full of false teachings, teachings. I mean, if we wanted to, we can take the book of First and Second Maccabees as historical, but as the Word of God, absolutely not, because there's false teachings in them. In fact, that's where the Catholics get a lot of their false practices that we don't believe in. Worshiping the dead, the idea of purgatory. Um, I had a list that we... Prayers to the dead, making a human effort, effort to make a amends for sin. Actually, I think that where we, that's where we stopped last week. But praying to the dead, um, making human effort to try amends for your own sin, and that eventually became known as the Mass. Um, giving greater emphasis on giving of tithes or offerings, giving to the alms. Um, praying for, giving to bring people from death and sin. Praying to an interceding and pray, having intercessory prayer on behalf of the saints, begging for them to get um, deliver you or provide this or help you find that. The worship of angels, which we know when we look at the scriptures is clearly forbidden. When we look at, uh, I think it was, oh, I can picture them out of the blank. Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot. I think when those two angels came, they wanted to worship them, and they said, don't worship me. There's other types of scriptures we see where Jesus actually came to people and allowed him, them to worship them. So angels tell you, tell, tell you themselves not to worship you, but actually this book, one of the books of the Apocrypha at least, promotes that, which would be the book of Tobit, chapter 12, verse 12. Purgatory and the redemption of souls after death is found in the Apocrypha, 2 Maccabees, and the Book of Wisdom, when it comes to the practice of magical arts or witchcraft, that's also found in the Book of Tobit. When we look at the Council of Trent, that's actually what placed the Apocrypha on the equal basis as the inspired Word of God and with the other books of the Bible. It was there that the Catholic Church accepted it and actually continues to hold to their writings to this day because they endorse many, the Apocrypha itself endorses many of the doctrines that cannot be backed by any other inspired book of the Bible. Because like I said, when we look at the book, um, Purgatory and all that, you're not going to find that in the Word of God. I mean, I did have a roommate in Bible school that we were preaching on ministry one time, and he stood up and he was teaching on the, preaching on the rich man and Lazarus and paradise and hell. And he got up and at the end concluded, that's why we believe in purgatory. It's like, no, Kyle, not purgatory, paradise, paradise. <laughs> but pur purgatory itself, as a teaching, comes from the Apocrypha. You'll never find that anywhere in the scriptures. Right along with praying for the dead, or that there's redemption after death. We know to be out. They use that Apocrypha a lot to teach gifts. I'm sorry, what's that? They use the Apocrypha to teach gifts. Guilt. Guilt. They guilt the okay. people. But then otherwise you can't get to heaven, you're going to go to hell. If you don't do exactly what we say, when we say it, how we say it, and if you don't follow that, then you're going to go to the first. Well, I and didn't that's see a that. Major teaching within the Catholic Church. Well, especially I can see the uh, giving into get people out of hell because when we go back to the Reformation at that time, Martin Luther never wanted to start his own denomination. He was just trying to get the Catholic Church to follow the Bible. And they wanted to hold on to their practices. And once again, it's the Apocrypha that backs up a lot of their practices. Was there a 
think a couple of things, you know, with the pocket plan is this, is that um, the silent years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, people have never learned the story on God, mm -hmm. on God is silent. That's when they were written, because they wanted to do something even if it was in flesh. Mm -hmm. And the unfortunate part is people buy into that, but then you come into the New Testament, and there's nothing in the Testament that gives uh, sound structure and completeness and authorization to those. It's inconsistent. Everything else lines up with the Old Testament and that. Uh, even, even, even though, if, and like you said, the New Testament church, you know, when it comes to mm -hmm. death, when it comes to purgatory, when it comes to uh, praying, to all that comes from, from men being in themselves. Just to piggyback off of what you said, brother, just to throw out there. Also, when we look at Christ and the um, writers of the New Testament, no, they'll quote from Old Testament prophets, but nowhere in their quotations do we see anything from the Apocrypha. They'll quote Isaiah, Ezekiel, but nothing's mentioned anywhere or even hinted at of the Apocrypha. And the scripture is very clear concerning the interpret inspiration of scripture and scripture alone. If someone would please find Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Galatians, Galatians 1, 8 and 9. And then go ahead and read that. Her mind, what manner of 
solution there should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. So when we look at the Bible, it states that she was a blessed handmaid. It doesn't say that she was anything more. It, and it didn't say, Blessed are thou above woman, but it said among women. So the Bible in no way regarded her as a higher being or, um, I should say, different than anyone in any way other than she was blessed in a way that no other woman was before because she was going to carry the Messiah. And it did. God was careful not to use above. He said she's blessed among women. So she, he even got in place on a higher pedestal. And when we look at Mary herself and how she viewed herself in regard to God and her Savior, she referred to herself in this manner. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 7, 47, I'll go ahead and read that. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. So she didn't place herself in a higher category or even on an equal layer with God. She said that she referred to God my Savior. She indicated that she was someone who needed saving. She was no better than anyone else. She herself stated that she needed a savior. She needed the ultimate sacrifice as recorded in Luke chapter 2, 22 and 24. I'll go ahead and read that. Luke 2, 22 and 24. And then when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy unto the Lord. So she needed a savior herself. If I go down a little bit farther. As it is written the law of the Lord. Okay, we read that in verse 24. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So even Mary herself had to make a sacrifice for her purification. She needed to make that sin sacrifice. When we look at sacrifices in the Old Testament according to Levitical law, that the sacrifice of a poor family was that of two turtle doves. So she needed restitution for her sins. And she needed just not restitution part way, but she needed all the way, just like everybody else did. She needed the ultimate sacrifice the ultimate sin offering to cover the to cover her sins. And when we look at Romans 3.23, what does Romans 3.23 state? For all have sinned, but Mary, mother of Jesus, and come short of the glory of God. Correct? No, I said all have sinned. That's everyone that was born after Adam and Eve. We have all been born into sin. Was Mary born? Yeah, she was born. She was human. So she was born into sin. And she had sin in her life, and she needed an ultimate sacrifice to do away with that sin. Now, when we look at the Roman Catholic Church, of course, they place Mary on a higher pedestal. They adore them or they worship them. They worship relics, saints, images, including the cross of Christ. And when we look at adoration, like we said, another word for adoration is worship. <clears throat> and what does the Bible state concerning worship of anything other than God? How does that, what, how does God classify that? Idols, idolatry. And what does the Bible state concerning God and idols? God said he's a very jealous God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the very first commandment. And if we get the second one, he makes that a little bit clearer. And he shows us a little bit more of his jealousy. Because he goes, don't even make any graven image. So when we look at the very first commandments, two commandments, they deal with the fact of idolatry and placing anything or anyone above God. Now, when we look at the Catholics, from what I understand, they do not actually claim to worship her, but what do they practice in actuality? They worship her. They what? They pray to her. 
They praise her. Well, what's praise? It's worship. Well, not yes, in a Catholic wedding, you have to give present red roses to her for the blessing of children. That's that's worship. Okay. And if we would compare that to paganism, it would be very. Uh, to me, that's not too different from if we have if they uh, have one of their feasts to the fertility god or anything like that, because you're looking and seeking their blessing. Which, if you study out, will give you a whole new idea on Easter Bunny and peace. But that's all right. I'll still eat the devil's candy. But when we look at Catholic quotations themselves. Even if they do not come out right and say that they worship Mary as an idol, we know from their own uh, writings that they do. From a book called Indul Indulgence Prayers, there's a line that states, I worship thee, O great queen. We talked about that when we did our study on Babylon, if you remember. What's one title for Mary? We know heaven. The whole, according to the book, The Glories of Mary, the church, the Holy Church commands a worship peculiar to Mary. The Pope at the Shrine of Our Lady on September 30th, 1979 said, By entrusting yourself to Mary, you receive Christ. In Mary, the Word was made flesh. According to the book, The Queen's Way, it would seem that God himself is subject to the Blessed Virgin, Actually, the authority that God has been, placed, has been pleased to give to her is so great that it would seem she has the same power as God. In the book, The Secrets of Mary, when you follow Mary, you will not go astray. It's, I have to change your notes. It's not he, but if she keeps her son from striking us, she keeps the devil from hurting us. So the Catholics revere Mary in a way that is Idol, and I hate to say not idol like, but it is idol in an in idol, in idolatrous fashion. But when we look at the Bible, <coughs> I need to research that point a little bit more. I'm not sure. What does the Bible state concerning Mary? We've already read it in Luke. How did Mary view herself? God says that she wasn't blessed above women, but among women. And the reason being, she was going to bring forth the Messiah. And when we look at scripture, there's at least one other person that was considered blessed. And she was a woman. It's in Judges chapter 5, verse 24. Judges 5, 24. Someone wants to find that please. No, she couldn't, brother. Very well, she could not be. So you go to Cotton uh Hotel by St. Children Lancaster, they they repeat that prayer over and over, you know, about Mary, you know, and mm -hmm. things like that. Oh, I believe it, brother. You want somebody to read judges? Yes, if you have Judges 524, go ahead and read it. Blessed above women shall Jan Janelle, J the wife of Heber, the Canaanite, be blessed. She is above women in the tent. So J.L., that woman that drove the spike through her enemy's forehead, she was also called blessed. So there were other women, but she was not worshipped. The Bible nowhere teaches us to worship women or any other particular individual besides Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, when angels came among people um, and they fell down at their feet, what did the angels say? Don't worship me. Well, you see, I also in Revelation, you know, verse 5 says, don't worship me. Exactly, brother. That's exactly what I was thinking. They were instructed not to worship the angel. And when we look at Scripture itself, one woman showed adoration for Mary, her, 
Mary, the mother of Jesus, in Scripture. And how did Jesus handle that in Luke chapter 11, 27, and 28? Luke 11, 27, and 28. 